Let's turn in our Bibles to Genesis 39. We've been thinking about, on Sunday evening, the, some of the doctrines of the faith, great doctrines of the faith. The last few Sunday nights we've been focusing on the doctrine of the fatherhood of God. And tonight I want to talk to you about some ABCs about the fatherhood of God. And I want to take my ideas mainly from Genesis chapter 39, and I'm going to read part of this chapter with you. So please stand together and follow along silently in your Bible, beginning with verse 31. Genesis 39, verse 31. One. Genesis 39, verse 1. And Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Ethiopian, brought him, uh, bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither. And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord had made all that he did to prosper in his hand. And Joseph found grace in his sight and he served him and he made him overseer over his house. And all that he had he put into his hand. And it came to pass from the time that he had made him overseer in his house that, and over all that he had that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and in the field. And he left all that he had in Joseph's hand. And he knew not all he had, save the bread which he did eat. And Joseph was, was a goodly person and well favored. And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph, and she said, Lie with me. Now let's move down to verse 20. And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were bound. And he was there in the prison. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison commanded, committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners that were in the prison. And whatever they did there, he was the doer of it. And the keeper of the prison looked not to anything that was under his hand, because the Lord was with him. And that which he did, the Lord made it to prosper. Thank you. Please be seated. <clears throat> Tonight we want to look at some ABCs of the fatherhood of God. We talked about some of the blessings that God has favored upon us because of the salvation that he's given to us through Jesus. And we've looked at the joy of his presence and his power and uh, the way that God chooses to operate to bring about his presence and power is through faith. That's his method or his plan of operation. And tonight we see it working in the life of Joseph and we see it working in our lives as believers. And uh, so... The, the ABCs are the attitude of Joseph and our attitude and the blessings of Joseph and our blessings and then the circumstances of Joseph. The attitude, A, blessing, B, circumstances, C. What about his attitude? God gave to this young man an unconquerable, positive attitude toward the Lord and toward the life. Joseph is one of the most godly human beings in the, mentioned in the Bible, and I think in human history. The Bible does not sugarcoat people's personalities. It takes a man of God like David, and it says, shows how David lusted, he committed adultery, he murdered, he lied, and yet he is called a man, a man after God's own heart. I don't like men of God like that, but the Lord does. And I would rather not expose a man like that, but God does. And you look at Samson, one of the judges, was 
strongest man that ever lived, Samson. And look at the, the negative side of his life. Take Samuel, the prophet Samuel, and what a godly man Samuel was, and yet the Lord said, I'm not, I'm not going to let you off the hook. Your sons made themselves vile before the altar, and you didn't restrain them. But now here you come to Joseph, and outside of a little bad judgment he might have used in relating to his brothers and showing him his coat that he was so proud of and, you know, being kind of his daddy didn't use too good a judgment and having a favorite child. But anyway, Joseph was a godly man, even from his youth. And when he got to be a young man, he was, he was godly. He loved the Lord. And it had a positive effect upon his thinking. Everything he thought, everything he evaluated, his attitude was made right. And so what a wonderful thing when God blesses people with an unconquerable attitude. And I don't think that the Lord just gives it to one person. I think that it was available for all of his other brothers. But it just seemed to stick with Joseph, you see. And, uh, and, and God wants to bless people with good attitudes like he did with Joseph. But the most helpful thing in our attitude and helping us to evaluate life and adjust to life in a constructive way and face life with the right kind of a spirit. The most helpful thing that we can possibly take is to take the Lord Jesus as our Savior. And listen, if you take the Lord Jesus as your Savior, that will help your outlook on life more than anything possible. I don't know. It's a shame that people have come to this time in history where we think of an attitude adjustment as stopping to get a drink of alcohol. Isn't that something? <laughs> Y'all have heard that, haven't you? Hey, wake up. Y'all have heard that, haven't you? That's right. People stop by when they finish work or other, other times and they get their attitude adjusted. They, get a, they stop and they get a drink. That's right. That's a way. Of, and it, it does. It changes their attitude a little bit. They have to anesthetize their brain a little bit to make them feel normal or something. Or to get away. And other people resort to medicines of various types. Uh, it, it is far beyond my comprehension to know why people turn to medicines so frequently and other drugs and, to adjust their attitudes. Listen. Jesus Christ, if you receive Him as your Savior, will do more to correct your attitudes than all of these other things combined. Amen. And He doesn't have a backfire. And it's just, it's just wonderful to know that the Lord Jesus will help you face life with all of its problems and all of its challenges and all of its difficulties in a positive way unconquerable spirit as Joseph had. You know, somebody said we need to be like a duck swimming, calm on the top, but paddling like crazy underneath the water. And life is a whole lot like that. The Lord, Lord will give us calmness and serenity and a positive attitude, but at the same time, He expects us to work like crazy at certain times to see that things get accomplished, you see. It's not an either or. But the Lord will help us our attitude so that we can uh, we can stay with it and we, we won't faint and we won't give up and we won't get discouraged. You know, the Lord's work is wonderful. That's the greatest work in the world. Somebody said, I wouldn't I wouldn't become second place to give up pastoring to be president. That's right. The president may have the most difficult job in this world, but the God-called pastor or the God-called missionary or the God-called parent has been called to do a job that is second to none, you see. So, but there are discouragements. Listen, I heard about one pastor, they said, how's your church doing? He said, well, it's dying slower than any other church I ever pastored. Now, brother, that's discouraging, you know. <laughs> but he tried to look even at that positively, you see. The others had died, died a quicker death while he was pastor. Listen, the Lord's work is many times discouraging. But if your attitude is right, and if you're not just making excuses, then the Lord will hold you up. Now, listen, even the Christian world 
will do all in his power to knock you down and flog you because you're not doing as good as they are over on the other hill. And we ought to be ashamed of ourselves as Christians to compare ourselves with other churches and to say, you know, when you go home on Sunday night and we've tried to serve the Lord here and you've had a Sunday school class and maybe you worked to prepare that lesson and you made your contacts and you visited and you prayed and lo and behold, most of them went on picnic Sunday. And uh, you might have ended up with one or two. Here you are, an educated person. You have a responsible job. You're, you're effective in all these things. You, you're, you're successful. And lo and behold, in your Sunday school class, you might have, might have one or two. You might not have anybody come up. Then you go home on Sunday night and cut on your TV set, and there is a church with 10,000 people in it. And this guy's preaching. It. Man, he's got on a $400 suit. And there's a choir of several hundred people behind him. And man, the devil say, you aren't any good. Man, you aren't any good. Your preacher's not any good. Y'all don't have anything. Why don't you just quit? Y'all know what I'm talking about. And these super dudes that are preaching the gospel in these churches, and these super dude churches that are better than any other churches, and they have their TV cameras and they have their, everything they have authenticates the fact that they are successful and you are a failure. Now if you don't need something to help your attitude, you'll just either go join their church or quit. The thing is, you need to be, you need to have a good case of the Lord Jesus and know who your master is. You know, Jesus would have to quit if he was to accept the same standards that a lot of these success people uh, think. That you have to have these benchmarks of success. And of course they wouldn't put it down theologically because most of them know better than that. But in essence, they milk their success to the nth degree. And it is worldly. It is worldly. Now listen. Missionary, watch your attitude. Because you can get down on yourself. You can get weary with God. You can uh, fall into a trap of temptation if you let your attitude become sour, ugly, bitter, and it can get that way. It's one thing at a conference in Ridgecrest to feel compassion for these poor lost heathen over there. When you get over there and they start stealing your stuff and spitting in your face, you don't have that same warm emotion there, you see. So you have to take your attitude to the Lord. Listen, Joseph took his attitude to God because he knew the Lord. And the Lord worked on Joseph's attitude so that he was able to cope in all these situations in a constructive way. Now listen. You know, I... People, I'm sure people have said, they haven't told me to my face, but I know it. So I know that they know it. That Tom Murphy is not the same person that he used to be a few years ago or ten years ago or five years ago or however. And I'm sure some of my friends are saying, what has happened to Tom Murphy? He's not the same person, you know. He doesn't, he doesn't go to the same places. He doesn't, you know. What has happened to Tom Murphy? Well, I want to tell you something. Every, not every morning, but often. This is not one of my daily prayers, but it comes frequently. I say, Lord, this morning I bring my attitudes before you because I know my attitudes are perfect. Are not perfect. <laughs> Quit laughing, brother. <laughs> I know. Now you may not know it, but I know my attitudes. Now should people be surprised that I change? I don't want to change gods. I don't want to change wives. I don't want to change churches. But I want to be different because when I pray and I say, Lord, I bring my attitudes before you, I expect God to do something with my attitudes. Amen. Normally, he doesn't do it immediately overnight. But usually, God in my life, he works like turning, turning a battleship. It takes a while to do that. So if, if I'm praying and I'm bringing my attitudes before God, and my values before God, I expect God to act in my life. So am I going to be surprised if maybe uh, I have a different idea about something or if I have a different way that I relate to something? Because God is active in my attitudinal 
portions. And uh, so I expect that, dear missionaries, that you need to make this an object of prayer. You are imperfect creatures. And the stress and strain of life, don't ever lose your vision. Don't ever let anything kill your vision. But I'm going to tell you what, if you don't let God get in your attitudes, your vision's going to die. So don't have, nobody has a right to kill your vision, but the Lord will amend it by working in that area of your attitudes. You know, we have some of the most magnificent mockingbirds around our house. And I enjoy hearing those birds sing. And I've tried to count all the different types of sounds that they make. It is just astounding how any little creature that tiny and that small can sing like that. But you know, there's one thing that irritates me about mockingbirds. Really, there's two. I'll tell you one. One thing that irritates me about mockingbirds is when it's dark, dark, dark at night, and I'm trying to sleep, and they're right out in that oak tree, right by my bed. And man, they sing all night, Amen. all night, right there in that oak tree. Now, it's pretty, but sometimes I get aggravated. Why, why don't they sing? Well, they sing some in the daytime, but they especially love a real dark night when somebody's trying to sleep, you see. <laughs> I praise the Lord, glory to God, and hallelujah. <laughs> That's right, somebody. Yes, yes. Okay, but now listen. May God help us in our attitudes. When the night is dark, and when it looks like people are asleep to our needs, to just keep that song and ask the Lord to help our attitudes be to, to be genuine and to be real and to be positive and growing. Now listen. You need to pray every morning to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And I like to start off my prayer in the morning by saying, Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. Now, I know there are a lot of quacks and a lot of crackpots that in the name of Jesus, everything. This offering plate in the name of Jesus. This set of keys in the name of Jesus. This piece of paper in and I realize that, but that doesn't take one smidgen of disrespect in my heart for that phrase in the name of Jesus. That's their problem. If they use it in vain, even play in religion or even acting like they are holy and spiritual, that is their problem. I still believe in praying in the name of Jesus. And in the name of Jesus, I pray to be filled afresh that day with the Holy Spirit. Now, what does Galatians 5.22 say? It says, the fruit of the Spirit is love. Help me. Joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Eight, nine. Nine. Okay. All of that is attitude, isn't it? Isn't all that attitude? Now, how are you going to get your attitude adjusted if you don't have that daily feeling of the Holy Spirit? Now, how many of you pray daily to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Don't raise your hand necessarily. But how many of you will start, if you haven't been doing it or if you're already doing it, will you do that every day? Hold your hand up. If you don't hold your hand up, come up and rededicate your life and ask the Lord to help you do that. And you do it too, missionary, because you can't have the attitude that God wants you to have if you're not filled with His Spirit, Amen. you see. Because don't ask for a feeling because the Lord works, He works in our feelings, but this attitude has more to do with just feelings. It has to do with assessments. It has to do with, with uh, commitments. It just affects every facet of our life. It keeps you going in the way Jesus wants you to go, or it redirects your path. In some of my prayers, I say, Lord, do this, or change my prayer, or redirect my path. If you don't want this, change my prayer. But Lord, I need your help. And God has promised to give us his help. So Joseph's attitude. Now, Joseph's blessings and your blessings. Missionaries expect God to bless you. You are not going, even though you are giving up family, even though you are giving up security. You're taking a risk. You're taking a risk by get, getting on that airplane. You're taking a risk by going into a strange culture. And in in many respects, but you're trying to get as prepared as you can get. But look, expect God's blessings. 
Expect God's blessings over there. And every one of these missionaries that report back to me, when they get there, they say, God is here. We feel him. This is where we belong. Man, that is wonderful. Only God can do that. Look, the newness will wear off and all of the excitement and so forth, it'll wear thin and it'll wear out. But the blessings of God's presence, you need to expect them. And what does it say? It says that the Lord was with Joseph and made him to prosper. Isn't that something? Now listen, I believe that God expects his blessings to be upon his people. Look, I, I don't think, you know, this name it and claim it theology, if you want a new Mercedes, then you pray in faith and the Lord will give it. You, you might get that Mercedes. But I, that's not the same thing as blessing. You might get the Mercedes and lose a son or a daughter. Is that blessing? Listen, God takes the whole thing into account. And our God, our Father, wants to bless us. So that's B, blessing. My God, my Father, wants to bless me. Say that with me. My Father wants to bless me. Say it again. My Father wants to bless me. Now we need to believe that and we need to expect these blessings. Live expecting great things from God. You say, well, when will they come, you see? One of God's greatest blessings is opening your eyes to where you can see what He's doing. That's one of the greatest blessings of the tithe. The people that cheat God out of His tithe, they're going to miss it. They may have houses, lands, and money, and everything else, and still they're going to miss it because it says in the Bible, Prove me now here with them, saith the Lord of hosts, and see if I will not open the windows of heaven. See? So when people cheat God out of His tithe, they will never see how God is blessing, even though God is sending blessings down on all people, you see. So expect God's blessings. Live expecting His blessings. And it says that the Lord was with Joseph and that he was a prosperous man and we expect God to cause us to prosper. And not only that, God blessed the Egyptian that Joseph was around. Now, I've told you before and I'm going to tell you again that anybody who stays around me for very long, I expect God to bless them. I mean that. I think it's biblical. Now, if they don't get a blessing and they're around me, then something is wrong with them. Because God has saved me and He is in my life. And just as He was in Joseph's life, He is in my life. And because of Joseph and His God in Him, God blessed this Egyptian. Then God blessed the jailer. And then God blessed Pharaoh. And everywhere Joseph went with God's blessings in him, God blessed the people that were around him. Now listen, these Mongolians over there, many of them don't have any idea of the blessings that are coming their way. When this family of Brunson goes over there and God's blessing them, any people who are open to God, open to God's direction, that avail themselves of this opportunity, they have a tremendous blessing because God is sending this family there. Listen, they don't know, but we know and we claim God's promise and they go expecting not only for God to bless them and be good to them, but through them, God is going to bless these people over there. Amen. Oh, listen, it's wonderful. It's wonderful to know that. I love the song, when upon life's billows your tempest tossed, when you're discouraged thinking all is lost, count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it'll surprise you what the Lord hath done. Are you ever burdened with a load of care? Does the cross seem heavy you're called to bear? Count your blessings, every doubt will fly, and you'll be singing as the days go by. When you look at others with their lands and gold, think that Christ has promised you his wealth untold. Count your many blessings, money cannot buy your reward in heaven nor your home on high. So amid the conflict, whether great or small, 
Do not be discouraged. God is over all. Count your many blessings. Angels will attend, help, and comfort give you to your journey's end. Then see circumstances. Circumstances can be extremely discouraging. I heard about a man who went to the mission field and because of his wife's health, he had to come back. He was very, very disappointed. Circumstances. But rather than giving over to bitterness and just giving up, he said, Lord, we can't be where I want to be, but I believe in missions. And I want you, and this is, this is my interpretation of the story that I read. I didn't know the man in person. He said, Lord, I want you to help me make a lot of money so that I can give it to missionary support. The man's father was a member of a church and just as a little sideline he had an orchard and he would make the grape juice for the church's Lord's Supper that they had. And God gave this young man, this son from the mission field, he gave him an idea. My father's making this grape juice for the Lord's Supper. I think I'll try my hand at it. And he started, he started getting into grapes. You know who this man was? His name was Wells. Anybody ever heard of Welch's grape juice? Yes, you have. This is the same guy. Circumstances went bad on him. But because of God in his life, he did the best he could, and lo and behold, God continued to bless him, and God continued to use him. Joseph was faithful where he was. You know, I, I don't like <clears throat> rapidly changing circumstances. But for some reason, they come from time to time. And when they come, we need to remember people like Joseph. The Bible says he served his master, his earthly employer. He was faithful where he was. He didn't like necessarily being sold into slavery, but I can just see him now as he's sold by his brothers and he's thrown in a dungeon. And a different circumstances. And here's Joseph in his dungeon saying, Hallelujah, I'm in this dungeon. <coughs> it is wonderful being in this dungeon. Praise the Lord. And then along come the Ishmaelites and they buy him. And there he is going down towards Egypt. He, I can just hear him singing, Thank you, Lord, that I'm a slave. It's just wonderful being a slave. You know, really, I think probably he did that after he got the proper assessment because he was still alive. They didn't kill him, you know. He could sing. And he had, God gave him a godly attitude. God was in him. And what happened when he got to Potiphar's house and he, Potiphar saw what was going on in his life he's, and he was a servant to Potiphar, he said, Hallelujah, I am a slave to Potiphar. Isn't that great? I'm going to just, Lord, what a privilege. I'm going to be the best slave that he ever saw. And man, just a little bit, Potiphar said, Look, just keep a record of anything I have. Just don't even worry. But just make sure I have plenty to eat. He just, oh, everything went to him. And then when he had this awful experience with his, his, uh, his boss's wife accusing him of rape, attempted rape, and he ended up in jail, what a circumstance to be in. You know what he said in jail? Well, I don't know for sure. But I can just hear him now. Lord, I love being in this jail. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. You know, he had to have that kind of attitude for God to raise him up. Suppose he had gotten bitter. Oh, Lord, what have you done? Nobody treats me. Why, he would have been the last guy in the jail. It didn't take him but just a little bit to just say, man, that guy's different. He has got something. And a little bit, lo and behold, he was the head of everybody in the jail, helping the jailer out. Now, isn't that wonderful? Look, a lot of times, life gives us awful circumstances. And we can say, I don't want to take a bath. Glory to God, hallelujah, praise the Lord. I don't want to take a bath. But glory to God, before long you'll be saying, glory to God, I want to take a bath. Glory to God, hallelujah. And so the Lord just blesses. In all circumstances, you know, you may, you may not be blessed 
you think you may not be blessed with the most brilliant mind. Many times it, it's not the brilliant mind that God raises up. You may have some kind of a handicap. But if you have the right attitude and if you realize God's blessings are on you, lo and behold, God can use that hand. You won't even know you're handicapped. I remember visiting in one of our nursing home ministries and people said there, we were having so a lot of the elderly people blind and infirm in wheelchairs and everything. And it was around Thanksgiving time and I couldn't believe it. One after another, people blind and lame in wheelchairs, and one after another would say, I thank God for good health. And another would say, well, I'm so glad I have good health. And I couldn't believe it. I, I just never would have dreamed it. Elderly, broken health, blind, deaf, and one after another saying, I thank God for good health. What if they don't know they're blind and lame and half sick? They must be pretty happy, you see. So what are we talking about? What a, what a father, what a heavenly father we have to work in all of our situations. Just remember, my father is rich in houses and lands, and he holds the wealth of this world in his hands, of rubies and diamonds, of silver and gold, his coffers are full. He has riches untold. And I'm a child of the King. I'm a child of the King. When Jesus is my Savior, I'm a child of the King.